So hello again to everybody. I hope you're refreshed now after the meditation. <laughs> so I thought that today I'd speak a bit about compassion because I think compassion is one of the most ennobling qualities of the human heart. You know, it's what makes us distinctly human compared to other realms of existence, you know, where there may be more selfish interest and less of the compassion. Somebody asked me um, why I want to speak about compassion and why it's the most important quality. And I really couldn't answer. My only answer was how could you even imagine a world without it, you know? Can you actually imagine a world without kindness? It would simply be unlivable, you know? I think we wouldn't even survive. So from the moment that we're born, you know, compassion is what sustains us. The child needs that warmth and that care of the mother to thrive. So it's, it's an interesting um, subject. You know, some people say wisdom is more important than compassion. But in fact, I think true compassion includes wisdom. It's not possible to separate the two. So one of the interesting things that I read about um, Bhikkhuni Sangamitta, the Arahat Bhikkhuni who took the Buddha Sasana, the Bhikkhuni Sangha, to Sri Lanka was that she was actually motivated by compassion. And this is something I read about recently in the Mahavamsa, I think. Um, the King Asoka, the Emperor Asoka, he asked his son Mahinda to go to Sri Lanka. But initially he was very distraught about his daughter going, because I guess there was still that attachment there, you know, which is any mother can understand, right? And um, Bhikkhuni Sangamitta said, Emperor, dear king, please allow me to go. The injunction of my brother is imperative, and the women who want to ordain in Sri Lanka are many. It's absolutely essential that I should go on that account. So again, you, you see compassion as the most motivating of all the factors. And um, it was the Buddha's motivation for teaching. You know, not only was compassion something that people felt in his presence, it was also what inspired him to teach. And um, last year I was in India at the pilgrimage sites in India and um, I had in my mind, you know, that perhaps Bodhgaya or Kusinagar were the most important places, the most inspiring, because that's where the Buddha attained enlightenment and then went into Parinibbana. But I didn't expect to feel so moved at Sarnath. And to me I figured that was the most important of all the holy sites because that was where the Buddha realized that the Dhamma is something that can actually be taught, you know. Until then, he, he had attained the truth, he had attained the end of suffering, but he didn't actually know that this could be transmitted to other people. And it was only at Sarnath when he taught, you know, and if initially he was rebuffed, right, by his disciples. But then when he taught the Dhamma Chaka, Pavatana Sutta, five of his friends became stream enterers. Or was it, no, sorry, one of his friends became stream enterers initially. And from that he knew that the Dhamma can be taught. It's only because of that amazing quality of the Dhamma that we're all here today and that there's such a thing as the fourfold assembly. So I find this so inspiring, you know, just to realize that it's the compassion that allowed him to teach that has sustained the Dhamma for so long. So this was also, um, he said, you know, I teach for the happiness and benefit of many. This was his only real intention, and it affected the way he treated the sick people, you know. There was this monk with all the boils that none of the other monks would care for, but the Buddha cared for. And he said, you know, treating the sick is like treating me, you know, do unto them as you would to me, basically. Um, also, he taught for compassion for future generations, which again is why we're all here today, right? And then out of compassion, he stopped Angulimala, the serial killer, from destroying the 900 and, well, the thousandth person. <laughs> um, so his whole life was infused with compassion. So compassion it has a few words in Pali. One of them is karuna, which means basically, I guess the same thing as compassion in Latin, which is to feel with or to resonate with. And then there's another beautiful word, anukampa, which is the, the name of our project, which literally means to resonate with, like to tremble or vibrate with. So it's always that feeling of connection between oneself and others, you know. And I think this is the beauty of 
all the Brahma Viharas, that its ability to connect us in our humanity and to go beyond the confines of a self, selfish sense of self. So Anukampa is a very beautiful word. And another um, synonym is Daya, which means empathy, which is, I think, one of the most important um, prerequisites, really, for compassion. Because unless we can feel with others and empathize with their situation, how can we really generate that compassion and that wish for them to come out of suffering? So I think one of the uh, more modern translations of compassion is um, um, a kind of um, sympathy and kindness towards the suffering that other people experience, along with a wish and an effort to alleviate that suffering. So it's not just a feeling, but it's also a sense of wanting to respond in, a, in an appropriate way to compassion. So this also points towards the wisdom element. You know, we need to know how to respond in an appropriate way. So if somebody's suffering and, and really in distress, it's not always suitable or appropriate to say, may you be happy, you know, because they're not happy. <laughs> and then they can feel maybe that's more pressure on them to come out of it. But compassion kind of implies the ability to stay with that suffering and to be able to embrace it and be present for somebody else. So this is also a difference between empathy and sympathy. Sympathy, there's still that little bit of distance, you know, between yourself and the other person. But empathy really means feeling into that pain of another and yet knowing a wise response, which comes from a place of stillness and peace in the heart. So it's quite an exalted practice, really. So it's one of the Brahma Viharas, as everybody here will know. And uh, the Brahma Viharas are also known as immeasurable states because the mind becomes basically measureless. It doesn't measure others. It doesn't have any boundaries. Um, and it can completely dissolve the sense of self and other. So this is also a way that it contributes to developing the path of wisdom. You know, we're all brothers and sisters in aging, suffering, and death, right? I was just in Hamburg recently, and um, right behind where I stayed, there was a cemetery. It's the second largest in the world. And there's 1.5 million people buried there, which is actually, I was realizing afterwards, it's the same number of people that are actually living in Hamburg. <laughs> So for every person you see in the street or running around, you know, in their cars or whatever, there's the equivalent number of people in the cemetery, which is quite, you know, quite something to contemplate, actually. You know, so likewise, all of us here will be replaced by other people in 100 years. Nobody will know we were even here. You know, so is it really worth fighting with people or arguing with people? So, yeah, Brahma actually means a kind of godlike state, because those realms are realms where there is no hatred, there is no cruelty or wish for harm. And vihara means a kind of abode or a dwelling. So this kind of um, infers that the Brahma viharas can become places where we live, where we dwell all the time. You know, The mind can become so infused with these qualities that it becomes like our home. And it's a very beautiful idea, you know, that the these qualities of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, which I like to call rejoicing joy, because I think it's more of a, a kind of rejoicing in other people's happiness, and also equanimity. They can become a constant dwelling place. And the more we reflect on these and incline our mind towards these, the more these qualities sink into our heart and basically transform our character. You know, so that we no longer react the way we used to do. You know, the tension and irritability, um, all those things which contribute to the hindrances in meditation are so much diminished that it really affects the way we, we relate to people in our everyday life. And as such, these qualities are known as, you know, sublime and exalted states of mind. So the Brahma Viharas can be taken into very deep meditation, known as the jhanas, which you're all aware of, I'm sure. Um, and this is kind of the pinnacle of development of these qualities. But at the same time, the Buddha said something very inspiring, which was that even if you develop these things for a finger snap, just means, you know, like less than a second, you're worthy of being called a disciple of mine, and you don't eat the alms food in vain. 
So this is, of course, referring to the monastics, right? That until we're actually developed in these qualities, in a way we're indebted to our supporters. We're taking the food, but we're not able to yet really serve. But once we can develop these qualities in the heart, we're worthy of being supported. And I think you can extend that to people in the lay world too, you know. It also doesn't mean that we don't support people who don't have these qualities, but just that the coming result of supporting people on the path is so much stronger. And I think I could feel that when I came here today, you know. I felt a little bit nervous not knowing what to expect, and then when I got here it was so calm, and I felt like I was really surrounded by friends in such a loving space. It just dissolves that sense of, you know, self-consciousness or, or nervousness, and, and helps us all connect. So it's just really beautiful to see the harmony here and that sense of community. It's very inspiring. So yeah, the four Brahma Viharas also have a very beautiful relationship to each other. They also don't exist separately from each other. And I think when we cultivate them, it's important to remember that um, we do need to cultivate each one. And in a way, I, I think of it as almost quite sequential. Because I think equanimity without the metta, the karuna, and the mudita is quite dry. But when you have these qualities very well developed, the equanimity becomes very rich. Not just a kind of indifference or a coolness, but something that's imbued with the other qualities too. So it knows the appropriate response, and it also knows when to say, okay, that's all I can do, I need to accept this situation now. So it's also likened to um, a simile of four children. So metta's likened to the way a mother would feel towards a child who is just a very young person and just needs a lot of love. Maybe they're quite endearing. They haven't become kind of cheeky teenagers yet. <laughs> and, uh, and so her natural feeling is just this feeling of metta, of love and, and protection, <laughs> a kind of benevolence. And then compassion's likened to the way you feel towards a sick child. So you're concerned for that suffering, you know. You don't push that away. You feel with the child, and you also have that response of wanting to alleviate that person's pain. And then the mudita is likened to the way a mother feels about a child who is, or a father, I must include the men, <laughs> the way uh, a father would feel towards a son or a daughter who is in the prime of their life, so very happy and, you know, full of... Uh, excitement for the future. I was discussing just now with uh, <laughs> a couple of the people here, I won't embarrass you, and they were full of excitement about the future, where they'd like to travel to, the cultures that they'd like to visit, and you know the various ways they'd like to serve when they're older. Very beautiful conversation. <laughs> and I felt a lot of mudita, you know, that they're growing up in this culture where they have this access to people from all over the world, and, and yeah, a very un intra-cultural society, which is so lovely. And that's also a part of the metta, you know, that it dissolves boundaries, so there's no place anymore for prejudices or biases towards anybody. You know, we're all basically brothers and sisters, and we can really rejoice in each other's differences, you know, in different cultures, the way they dress and speak and the kind of festivals they have, the... Yeah, kind of food, which is very important as well. <laughs> so that's uh, the mudita. And then the equanimity is uh, the way that a mother or a father would relate to a child who's grown up and perhaps left home, maybe married with a family and quite settled, you know. And so now the feeling is one of deep care, but also equanimity. She can just relax, you know, and feel satisfied and, um, yeah feel satisfied that that child is, is settled in life. So these four qualities together are really important for balancing each other too. Because, I mean, compassion is quite intimately connected to the truth of suffering, right? Because it's the way love responds when you see another person in distress or you see suffering. It's just a way that love responds in that situation. Um, so it can have a tendency to become a little bit melancholic or brooding, you know, if you're not careful. So when you practice the, all the four Brahma Viharas, they balance each other like a lattice of kind of interwoven states, you know. They sort of balance the, the kind of more, not really negative side, but the way it can tend to go, you know, if your mind's not really guarded. 
so meta has a kind of very um, broad kind of scope so it doesn't differentiate between anyone and that can help compassion from becoming kind of more directed towards a victim than the perpetrator for example but then compassion can help metta and mudita from becoming complacent you know because if you're always enjoying life and rejoicing in the happiness you can tend to forget that there is suffering and it's important to meet that suffering in order to understand and ultimately transcend that so these qualities can help compassion to kind of, you know, come lift up out of the dark sort of heaviness. And the compassion can also remind us that there is still so much suffering in the world and these qualities alone may not help alleviate that. Ultimately, only Nibbana is the end of all suffering. So I think this is very beautiful. And as I said, you know, all of these qualities help the upekka from getting very um, kind of indifferent or aloof. It keeps, the, it keeps the equanimity very connected with, with people, with, with the reality, you know. Because I think there can be a tendency, I don't know about in the Sri Lankan community, but in the Western community, there can be a tendency to come to Buddhism and to the practice with an idea to escape suffering. And this is sometimes difficult to differentiate from a genuine wish to understand suffering. Because, of course, we want to come out of it, right? But sometimes it can be motivated by a kind of aversion, like a kind of, I'm not good enough, you know, I'm never going to be good enough, and there's parts of me or there's parts of life that I'm not quite ready to face. So if I go into the practice, I'll be able to sort of transcend them. But sometimes you can transcend things prematurely if you haven't actually met the suffering and really, you know, understood the issues, understood the way that we're kind of compounding the suffering in ourselves with our attitudes. And I think the Brahma Viharas are really helpful in this way because they're also part of right intention. So right intention, as most of you know, is the second factor of the Eightfold Noble Path. And basically that is ahimsa, sankapa, which means non-violence or um, non-cruelty. And that's the actual antidote sorry, compassion is the antidote to the cruelty. So, and then the other one is uh, avyapada, which means, uh, it basically means a mind of metta, a mind of non-ill will. And the last one is nekama, which means a mind of renunciation or letting go. So this can also be seen not necessarily as a physical letting go, but as an attitude in meditation. And if you have these attitudes in place, then it doesn't really matter what you experience in meditation. What's much more important is, you know, the way you relate to that experience. And I think this is very crucial, you know, especially if we are coming from a sort of sense of feeling not good enough or we need to correct ourselves, improve ourselves. And there might be that slight kind of aversion when we experience unwanted states of mind or sensations in the body. Somebody asked me today as well about distractions in meditation. And it's a common question, you know, because, of course, our mind gets distracted. It gets, you know, pulled out with sounds or, you know, suddenly a thought, oh, there was something on the television <laughs> that I wanted to see and, you know, oh, oh, well, uh, two more minutes meditation, you know. <laughs> so, obviously, you know, it's nice to feel that the mind might be still and maybe we don't need to face distractions but actually it's not the distraction that's so disturbing, it's more our relationship to it and our attitude when these things come up. And in a way, you know, it's very common for us to want to exclude certain experiences that are maybe not pleasant. But the real practice is in opening our heart to every experience. And compassion really helps us to do that. It helps us to meet the suffering or meet the agitation and hold it. You know, it helps us strengthen the mind in order to receive all the experiences of life. So life actually becomes much fuller. And I think it also gives a lot of meaning to suffering. One of the reasons that I started on the path, somebody asked me earlier, was that I saw very clearly how much suffering there was in the world at quite a young age. And my parents used to say to me, you know, why are you suffering so much? I mean, you have everything you could need. You have a loving family, you're good at school, you've got a best friend, you know, who's like a sister to me. And yet there was this sense of um, there being so much suffering in the world. You know, I'd turn on the TV and I can't remember at that time if it was the war, which 
war it was, but there's always wars going on, you know. And I was just asking myself, why does there need to be so much violence? And the only answer really that came to mind was greed, you know, just greed and a quest for power. And I was really, you know, looking for a way to understand this and a kind of way to respond as well. It's like, what can I possibly do as one human being to alleviate even a tiny fraction of the suffering in the world? Really, I mean, I was quite sort of desperate. I didn't know what to do. All I knew was that perhaps it had something to do with removing those causes for anger and violence and greed in myself, you know. Because what else can we do? We can't do that in anyone else and by that hopefully becoming an example. But I didn't know the path at that time. And, uh, and yeah, I'd often feel that there was something wrong with me for suffering and for feeling these things, you know. And I'd allow myself to feel them. But, and, you know, I wasn't afraid of the emotions, but I still wasn't quite sure what to do with them. And when I first heard the teachings, you know, that the Buddha discovered suffering, but also the cause... <laughs> I mean, this is already a relief, right? There is a cause. That means the cause can be removed. And then suddenly I had the practice, you know. I did my first retreat in India, and I was practicing to remove the cause. The cause wasn't removed, you know, in one retreat, and it still hasn't been fully removed. But just the idea that there was a path and that there was a way to come out of suffering was probably 80% of it for me. It was such a relief, you know felt like finally somebody is telling the truth. They're saying, yes, there is suffering. And that's okay, you know, that's really okay. It can actually be transformed into wisdom. <laughs> and with the wisdom comes compassion. So now, whenever I'm going through a difficult time, you know, I often remember that in the past when I've suffered, it has opened the heart and afterwards allowed me to connect more fully to others who are suffering with much greater compassion. And I think that also gives a lot of meaning to suffering. There was a really amazing, powerful story that I read recently from uh, Viktor Frankl. You may have heard of him. He's, uh, I don't know when he, if he's still alive even. Is he? <laughs> Do you know? Yeah. But he was a survivor of the Holocaust. And um, he kind of chose to stay in Germany, I think it was, to support his parents who were already, I think, captured by the Nazis at that time. Um, he had the chance to go to America to study there and become a great psychologist, which he later did. <laughs> but uh, he decided to support his parents, so he actually went into the concentration camps. And he was also looking for happiness, looking for meaning, and he said he found it there, and he noticed that it was those people who couldn't find meaning in the suffering who actually died in those camps. But those people who found a meaning beyond themselves, you know, he said there were people there, very few, but some, who would give their last piece of bread to the people waiting, you know, on the, to, in the gas chambers. There were people who would give their last piece of bread to those people, knowing fully well that they would probably not survive. And he said, you know, it showed that everything can be taken from a person, all your freedom, all your humanity and dignity, not humanity, actually, just dignity, except for your ability to choose your attitude in any given situation. And I just found that so powerful and so close to what the Buddha taught, you know. We can't always change our experience or, or flee from suffering or, you know, even come out of negative thinking or things we do. To, well, there are ways to come out of negative thinking. But we can always choose to have an attitude of kindness towards whatever we experience, which is what I was trying to convey during the meditation, you know, and this is what I've learned also from my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, that, you know, the choice to respond to something with kindness, with letting go, with gentleness, or to respond with, you know, negativity and grasping, pushing away, is always in our hands, as long as we're aware that that is a choice. <laughs> Yeah. So I also wanted to talk a bit today about self-compassion, because I think this is something that um, a lot of us tend to overlook. And when the Buddha taught, you know, he taught that we should practice the Brahma Viharas as to, to all as to ourselves. So I often think in the West it should be changed as um, 
to ourselves as to all. Because <laughs> it's much easier sometimes to treat others with kindness and compassion than it is to treat ourselves that way. I recently did a workshop in Germany while I was there, and um, it was a weekend retreat, and it was called Becoming One's Own Best Friend. And the reason for that was that I feel that we're so good at being friends to others, you know. We, we know what to say, we're kind, we're compassionate. And yet if we could hear the way we speak to ourselves sometimes, it's, it's quite different. You know, imagine if somebody could actually read inside your mind the way you speak to yourself sometimes, you know. Say you make a small mistake. Oh, for goodness sake, you're always doing that, you know. We wouldn't speak to other people this way, and yet we speak to ourselves this way. And it's really interesting. I think a, p a large part of it is conditioning, you know. We've been taught from a young age that we have to try so hard to perfect ourselves and, uh, you know, achieve, keep up with others. So we have these really, really high standards for ourselves. And one of the things that um, they've done research into self-compassion too, and they've found that it actually decreases anxiety um, and decreases perfectionism, which I thought was a really interesting one, you know. Because it just shows that we give ourselves such high standards. Even for me today, I was thinking, can I really convey what I want to say to people, you know? And then I remembered a friend of mine um, said to me, I think, you know, what would be really good for you is to give a really lousy talk. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? I'm not sure I dare, you know, purposely do that. She said, no, it would be really, really good to just go there and think, right, I'm just going to give a really bad talk and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I could see a point, you know, I mean, of course, I don't want to purposely give a really bad talk, <laughs> but I could see the point, because we give ourselves so much pressure and so much stress, and we'd never do that to another, you know? We'd just receive whatever someone was about to offer, right? Kindly and with humility and with gratitude. So it's really lovely to think about the ways we would treat a friend and see if we can start to treat ourselves in the same way, you know? Start asking that question. How would it change my experience if I treated myself the way I treat a friend? Or if I spoke to myself the way I speak to my best friend? How would that change my experience right now? No. So there's a lady called Kristin Neff who's done a lot of research into this self-compassion and she's identified kind of three aspects of self-compassion that are really helpful in um, you know, making sure you're on the side of compassion and not the opposite side. So one is that um, she contrasts an attitude of kindness with an attitude of judgment. So this is already quite interesting because judgment is often uh, an attitude we adopt when we don't really understand somebody. We don't understand the way they're conditioned or, you know, we expect them to be better than they are. So if you apply this to yourself, I mean, it can be really helpful to realize yeah, I am the way I am because of the way I've been conditioned, and within those conditions, I'm doing my best. You know, sometimes we want to behave a different way, but even if we want to, or another person wants to, we can't. We're conditioned the way we're conditioned. And I think when we stop judging that and start to understand that, an attitude of kindness can start to come through. One of the best compliments I got, actually, from an old friend of mine was that... Um, she spoke to me after a long time. I think in the early years I was quite um, an avid uh, Vipassana junkie, if you like. And uh, <laughs> I would tell everybody about Vipassana and how it changed my life. And I was probably quite strict about my discipline and, you know, in the meditation retreats, pushing myself a little bit, but loving to do that. You know, I love to do that. But it had probably led into a little bit of tightness and feeling that, that was the best for everyone, you know. And then years later, I met her when I'd started practicing much, much more metta. And uh, she said to me something like, well, I'm not really doing that much meditation. She was a bit shy to tell me because, you know, I was like the, you never miss your two hours a day, never. Um, she said, I don't do that much, you know. She said, what do you think about that? And I said, oh, I think meditation is a good thing to do. You know? And uh, I don't know, that was all that came to my mind. And she said, wow, you're so non-judgmental. And I thought, oh, really? <laughs> and partly I was sort of a bit shy because I thought, oh, I must have changed. I must have been really judgmental before. But I also thought that's such a wonderful compliment because when somebody's non-judgmental, you feel that you can just be yourself, you know? You feel accepted. 
Uh, one of the most beautiful things I get from my own teacher, Adrian Brown, is just this sense of feeling so safe, kind of receiving his trust and respect without having to earn it. It's just there. You know, the first time I met him, it was, it was just there. I felt very nervous because I'd heard all his deep talks that he gives to the monks and I thought, this person has attained deep knowledge, deep wisdom and a lot of compassion. And I was quite awed, you know, in his presence the first time I met him. And he kind of broke that out of me by playing around and joking like anything until I couldn't stop giggling. But anyway, <laughs> slowly I realized, you know, there was absolutely nothing to fear and I had his trust and respect. I had his trust and respect, you know. And this was such a gift. I knew within myself I could never break that, you know. When something so precious is given to you, you just feel you have to honour that, and you do live up to it. I think you do. And I've seen that in the monastery too. It's such a safe and warm environment there. You know, you see the young monks coming in, lay people in the beginning, a little bit tense, a little bit like, not sure I'm going to be okay here, I'm not going to be accepted or whatever. And they're not perfect people, they're just normal people. Some of them quite young, straight out of the nightclubs, you know, sometimes. And over time you just see them start to soften and they get this glow in their eyes, you know, a kind of sense of, ah, oh. it's, like it's like love, actually. And you feel that that's just been conveyed through the atmosphere, like through osmosis almost, from somebody who's so at peace within themselves that they can give that gift to others. And it's such a beautiful, transformative experience, you know, to be in the presence of somebody like this. So if I'm with Ajahn Brahm now, I'm just totally off guard, totally off guard, totally natural. <laughs> and it's so nice, I can really relax, you know, more than probably with anyone I know, apart from my own best friend. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I think I've always been looking for that um, inner best friend, because I know that I can accept most people, but I give myself much higher standards to uh, live up to than I do to others. So yeah, this is the kindness over the judgment, is the first aspect identified by this lady, Kristen Neff, which I think is really helpful. And the second one was, um, I think, a sense of uh, common humanity versus isolation. So this is really interesting, and I think this is something that happens in Asia much more naturally than it happens in the West, because we have become quite isolated, and we do live in these um, nuclear families, as you call them, which is not a very nice name. Um, you know, and it's just keeping in mind that we're all subject to birth, old age and death, like I said earlier, and that we're fragile, you know, and that we're fallible too, we make mistakes. And it's just part of being human, you know. We have to make mistakes to grow. I think Ajahn Brown calls it forward falling. So when you make a mistake, you don't fall down, you don't fall back, you fall forward. <laughs> and then you pick yourself up a bit further along the path. So you've learned something through your mistakes, you know. And it's really beautiful to be given that gift of being able to make mistakes. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect right now, you know. It's just not possible. And actually, I don't think you ever have to be perfect. That's not the point of the path. So, yeah, that sense of common humanity is, um, you know, part of Buddhism. It's, it's throughout the suttas. The Buddha always says, you know, treat yourself the way you'd like other people to treat you. And that's the whole premise of sila, you know. The whole point of the sila is non-harming, so not to harm others because you wouldn't like them to harm you in that way, right? So it's not something we adopt out of fear. It's something we adopt because we know that's a harmless way to live in the world and that's a beautiful way to give the gift of trust the gift of peace to other people. That's something really beautiful about being in the robes, actually, because, I mean, so far, Buddhism hasn't been destroyed. You know, we haven't done too many things that have destroyed our reputation. And sometimes I walk down the street and I just sense, even if people don't necessarily approach me, I've never been approached in a hostile way. And sometimes they speak to me and they don't know who I am necessarily, but, uh, or even that I'm Buddhist. But they feel a sense of safety, you know, which is really lovely. And sometimes they'll just start telling me all about their life. <laughs> or even just, you know, picking up an aspect they presume and saying, oh, I'm also vegetarian, you know. <laughs> then I don't tell them that actually we do, we can accept meat. But, you know, it, it's just interesting. People come in with what's dear to them. And they seem to talk about what's aligned to their values, you know. It's not just, um, okay, what's the weather like today? Which is fine too, but, you know. It's just really lovely that you feel that sense of trust and safety with people. 
which is what the Buddha also said, right? That you're dear to the humans and the devas and that, you know, people feel safe, animals feel safe. I'm digressing a bit, but I have to tell that story of one monk who um, lives in Thailand. And uh, there was a, he was meditating in a cave somewhere. You know, Thailand's a tropical country, so there's all kinds of creepy crawlies and snakes. <laughs> so this snake suddenly came up to him while he was meditating, and he opened his eyes, and there was a cobra, like, here, in his face, Psst. <laughs> hissing at him. I mean, what would you do if that happened? <laughs> would you say, may you be happy? <laughs> And this monk, he got out his hand and he went, Aww. just patted it on the head. <laughs> and the snake just, hmm, thank you so much. You know, I was really waiting for someone to accept me. <laughs> I don't know if that's really what he thought. But anyway, the snake just quietly went away. Isn't that amazing? So, you know, even animals feel safe when we have compassion. Because <laughs> they know we're not going to harm them. There's nothing to protect. There's nothing to fear. I like the one you brought up, like, compassion bring the wisdom, and wisdom bring in the compassion. Yeah. So that's a very good phrase. Right. People think most of the time it's the other way around. Exactly, yeah, yeah. The more I practice the path, I realize that, you know, all these qualities feed into the other. I was telling Lishani the other day that in the past I used to start my practice with Anapana, mm. and then Vipassana, and then Metta. Now I've almost reversed it. <laughs> So now I actually usually start with metta and compassion as a basis, you know, and I think this feeds into the second noble, second factor of the noble path, so the right intention, which is high up there, you know, in the beginning of the path. So I start with this kind of cultivation of an attitude, of the right attitude, and then gradually, you know, start to feel the feelings, the sensations, the emotions, whatever it is, with an inclusive mind, not with an exclusive attitude, you know, that this one doesn't deserve to be in my sitting today, you know, it's like, no, this knee is good, it's, you know, part of me. So I include all of that, and then naturally, over time, when the body and the mind are stilled and, well, relaxed, basically, you start to feel the breath, and the mind starts to become quiet on its own. So then that naturally leads into, you know, more of a samatha kind of state of mind, but it includes the wisdom, because you've seen how you're clinging, what you're clinging to, you know, and what happens when you, when you give that attitude of kindness, how the letting go happens. So it's a very inclusive path. But I think it's also good to know that these qualities of the Brahma Viharas can be cultivated. And one of the things with, I should probably finish by saying the last um, aspect of the self-compassion, which is, um, yeah, which is common humanity, awareness and wisdom, actually, over a sense of um, over-identification, right? So rather than experiencing what we're experiencing, what we experience and attach to it and think, this is my experience, this is, you know, oh, nobody else feels this, everybody else, look at everybody else, they're sitting there quietly, only I'm struggling in meditation. You know, it's just the awareness, which is not trying to push away, not trying to grasp, you know, not just trying to kind of keep the stiff upper lip and, yes, I can handle this, you know, but real kind of genuine, like, embracing and being aware rather than this kind of narrow identification. So this also feeds into wisdom because, you know, with the understanding of non-self, we realize, okay, this is a sensation. A sensation is one of the five khandhas, right? Do people know what the five khandhas are? The five... Um, the Buddha talked about five aspects of the human being, basically. So it's the body, the feelings in the body, the perceptions, the mental volition, which is like, it includes will, but it's also kind of whatever we create, however we react to our experience, and also consciousness. And for all of these, you know, basically this covers all of existence. There's nothing beyond this, actually. This incorporates everything that we can experience as human beings. But the Buddha said that each and every one is not me, not mine, not a self. It's subject to conditions. It arises dependent on conditions. And there's a cause to those conditions. So when that cause is removed, that phenomena disappears, right? That phenomena has to cease. 
So the body isn't mine, you know. I don't have control over that. If I had control over it, it wouldn't be suffering, but I don't have control. So it is by nature suffering, and there's nothing we can do about that. And I think that gives enormous relief, you know, to know that this is just an aspect of body, or this is just an aspect of feeling. It's going to be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And it's the same for everybody. One of the really beautiful um, stages on my journey has been serving a lot on retreats. So I was in India for many years, like doing lots and lots of Vipassana retreats, as many as I could, you know, every year, because I, I was there for that purpose. And I'd always serve a retreat after sitting one. And I found this especially helpful if I was getting into this kind of contracted sense of, okay, my practice, how's it going? Am I progressing? Am I going to get stream entry in this life? And, you know, this kind of thing. Oh, I've still got to deal with this and this and this. And I think, no, you know, why don't you go and serve a course? Because it's not healthy to, to start feeling like this, right? Even a little bit. So I'd serve a course. And I served 50 or more retreats over those years. And um, I started to see that there were only so many experiences a human being went through. There were only so many emotions that were possible, you know. And it was all within this spectrum. And it was so universal, you know, people who come to the retreats kind of, like I said about the monastery, a little bit tense maybe, or a little bit afraid, or, yeah, just a bit weighed down by life. And by the end, you wouldn't really need to say very much to them. You wouldn't need to say, oh, what's your name, or what did you do before you got here? There was just this sense of kind of being melted down, and, and you know, having experienced their inner world in a way they never experienced before. And people felt that this was a common experience. And I started to see that everybody went through this process. Everyone who came to the retreats went through the same thing. And it really depersonalized the whole process for me. You know, it made me realize we're all struggling in the same ways. And if we apply certain, um, well, if we practice the Dhamma, we all get the same results. <laughs> maybe not at the same time, you know, maybe not in exactly the same ways, but there's a lessening of suffering. So this was so beautiful. There was so much more I wanted to talk about, but we we're actually getting towards the end. Um, so I think I'll skip some of it, but um, I wanted to just talk before we end and hopefully have a few questions about, um, about the kind of ways of practicing self-compassion or compassion in general. So I think the first place we start is the sila, you know. And that includes qualities that um, are foundational to sila, such as generosity, such as gratitude, you know, really appreciating ourselves as well as others. I love this sutta in the text about, um, there's two actually, uh, the Upakilesa and uh, Chula Gosinga sutta, they both talk about um, three bhikkhus, uh, Nandia, Anuruddha, and Kimbila, and they live together in harmony. And the Buddha goes to see them, and he says, "You know, how are you doing? How's how do you live together?" And they say, "Oh, we um, we look upon each other with kindly eyes, which I love. I love this phrase, kindly eyes. And uh, we blend like milk and water. Whatever one person wants to do, I think, well, why don't I abandon what I want to do and do what that person wants to do?" So they all work in a team, and they say, our minds are, you know, our bodies are three, but our minds are one. So our bodies are different, but our minds are the same, because we all have this attitude of caring for each other, you know, dropping our own wants and desires and looking out for the other. And then the Buddha said, you know, have you attained any superhuman states worthy of the noble ones? Which basically means, like, uttari manusa dhamma, it means jhanas or stages of enlightenment. And they say, of course, you know, we have. And the Buddha says, well, you can expect that of people who live in this way together, you know. You can expect that they will achieve these states. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it just shows that this kind of mutual appreciation and, and gratitude, mutual respect is the foundation. And a lot of the time in communities, you know, you... Um, that's, that's one of the foundations that you spend a lot of time working on because people haven't learned to live in harmony yet. We have our own selfish desires and we don't always see how they're affecting other people. You know, so a lot of work has to be done at this level and it's probably the most of it, I would say. Yeah. 
It's the most important thing, the seal of the virtue. It's a protection and it, it conditions the mind to be ready to go deeper in samadhi and to actually penetrate you know, the noble truths. So working on the seal is really, really helpful. And there's just a few little um, things you can do as well to kind of generate gratitude in your lives. One of them is, um, I think part of the practice is learning to notice the happiness that is there, notice the kindness, the gratitude that is there in our own hearts, you know, and also in society. And so often we overlook it. So one little trick, it sounds a little bit childish, but it works, is just to write down at the end of the day, like, three things that happened where you uh, did a little kind act towards somebody. Three things that you did out of kindness. However small, even if it's just a smile, you know, or just maybe offering someone a cup of tea, or standing up and giving your seat in the train, whatever. And three things that someone else did to you out of gratitude and kindness. And to just write that down, you know. That's really, really helpful. Because sometimes we, they're there, but we just don't notice them. Then another one that I like is, um, I was asking this during the weekend retreat. It's three questions that you can put to your experience. So one of them is, what am I doing? So that means maybe physically, verbally, or even mentally. How is it affecting me? Okay. So part of self-compassion is asking, how am I? What does this experience need? Like, what do I need now? And then the last one is, um, where is this leading me? Right. So that's, what am I doing? How is it affecting me? Where is it leading me? And this is really, really helpful. You can do this with almost anything. And if you know the way the Dhamma is supposed to be leading, it's supposed to be leading to peace to disentanglement, you know, to sambodhi, to abhinya, which means the higher wisdom. This is the way we know it can be dumb. We know it's dhamma for sure. That was the Buddha's teaching to Mahapajapati Gotami. And also to one other monk who I forget the name of. So, you know, we need to make sure that our behavior and our acts of body, speech and mind are moving in that direction, inclining towards nibbana. And in this way, you know, the whole life can become aligned with the Eightfold Path. Everything you do in life, you can look at it from, in terms of the Eightfold Path. Okay, now I'm going to work. How do I make this livelihood right livelihood? If it's right livelihood, you're practicing, you know? You don't have to wait till you get home to meditate. You're practicing. You're practicing one of the factors. And we need to practice all of the factors. You can't have a sevenfold path or a sixfold path, you know? It's an eightfold path. So in this way, nothing's ever wasted. So these are really the preparatory sort of measures to just uplift the mind and to have that really strong basis of sila. And that, in a way, is a preparation for cultivating the Brahma Viharas. So for the cultivation, there's many methods also. But, um, yeah, some of the things that I've been um, reading about and experimenting with are things like um, visualization. So we can visualize sometimes what compassion means to us or a person perhaps that's you know, we, we think of as a compassionate person. Sometimes people don't like that kind of iconography, so they maybe choose something like a tree. You know, you could choose a huge oak tree or maybe a beautiful tree that you have in your back garden or even a sunset or something like this and just have that vision of something compassionate. So usually the attributes of compassion are things like warmth, strength, kindness, those kind of attributes that really evoke that feeling. So that's um, the visualization or the imagery. And then there's memories too. You know, you can evoke a feeling of compassion by remembering times in your life when others were compassionate to you or you were compassionate to others. And I had a memory recently about, uh, I w went to Lanzarote, actually. I've been in many places this year, but I went to Lanzarote in February. I was invited to do a self-retreat, so I just had this beautiful space to myself, two lovely friends who cooked for me, and just time to be with myself in a very relaxed and simple setting. And one day we decided, okay, let's see what happens if we walk to the next village, which was actually nine miles away over lots of volcanoes. <laughs> so we walked there, and I didn't actually have my arms bowl. I probably shouldn't say this on the tape, but anyway, I took a salad bowl. Because <laughs> I thought, well, you know, it's, it serves the purpose of an arms bowl. So in essence, it is, right? So I took this bowl. And we stood around in this town called Aria, of all names. It's actually called Aria, like the Arias. <laughs> um, and there was no one around. It was off-season. You know, the Spanish didn't come out that early. <laughs> 
And uh, the first shop we stood outside, we got asked to leave. Because the woman came out very embarrassed and apologetic. She said, my husband feels a bit embarrassed, you know. She said it in Spanish, my friend understood. He feels a bit embarrassed, he's not sure you should be standing outside a shop. <laughs> um, you know, it might put the customers off, kind of thing. So he said, okay, that's fine. You know, it was getting on like 11, 11, 15. And I was saying to my friend, I, know, I knew we wouldn't get anything. <laughs> she said, but there is an organic market that you can go to. So we went to this organic market, stood outside, nothing happened. So people are coming and just walking past. And I was just standing there feeling like, oh, well, it's a nice town. And, you know, people are a bit, there aren't many people around. And then suddenly this man came out, and he'd looked at me going in, but he hadn't said anything. He came out, and he just um, came up to me and very gently put all these bananas and bread in my salad bowl <laughs> and then gave me a lot of mineral water because we'd walked a long way, a big bottle of mineral water. And he just said, thank you, and that was it. He, let, he went away. And I thought, goodness me, it was really so touching. It's quite a classic thing that you're offered also, bread and bananas. It's really classic. And it was so interesting. From then on, people started coming. It was as though they'd seen, okay, how it works, the reciprocity, and they all wanted to be part of it. So next, this other person came, and I think that was just a teenager, actually, who'd been playing his guitar with dyed hair, and he gave money to my friend. I said, I can't take the money, you know, he gave money. And then the woman from the organic shop came out and she started giving us all this organic food and saying, is it okay, you know, if you wait here, I'll get you some more. And then the best bit was that the woman from the shop came running over. She said, oh, you're still here. I'm so glad you're still here. She said, I'm so sorry about what happened. I brought you food. She said, is it okay? Are you vegetarian? And she brought cheese, avocados, tomatoes, bread. It was a full meal, you know. And it was so touching. She just brought so much food. And it was just an interesting experience to sort of experience people's kindness and generosity and to see how it feeds into others. And the whole place seemed to just come alive with this spirit of generosity and kindness. It was just magical. So I often remember that, you know, when I'm, I'm wondering what is compassion. I think that's compassion, yeah. That's really beautiful. So compassion is a very deep subject, and there's a lot we could say. Uh, I didn't expect to talk so long. But, uh, you know, just to end by saying the potential for compassion, not only to experience the jhanas, which in themselves are the platforms, in a way, for, li for insight to arise. The reason being that the hindrances are absent, right? When we're in those states of samadhi, the hindrances are absent. And also the mind has become very, very soft. The Buddha says, you know, it's like um, gold. When you l melt the gold and purify the gold, it loses all its impurities. It becomes soft and malleable. I love that word, malleable. It means you can shape it into whatever you want to. And he said it's without bias. The mind at that moment has no kind of predilection over what it should or shouldn't experience, so it's open. And it's cushioned. It's got this cushioning, like it's soft enough to be able to see something that maybe you've never seen before, you know. It doesn't have that kind of, oh, I don't want to see non-self, or it can't all be suffering, there's got to be some place that's not suffering. It actually is prepared to see those things, because it has no preference anymore. It's open and it's boundless, it doesn't measure. So this is one potential, you know, of all the Brahma Viharas. Of course, the other one is through the teaching and the spreading of the Dhamma. But another way it feeds into wisdom is that it's a cultivation of the mind, right? It's something that you create in your mind. It's cultivated. And what you notice when you have any amount of metta, compassion, mudita, equanimity, the world looks different. Things don't look the same anymore, you know? Situations in your life, people in your life, it all seems softer, you know? You don't see the faults so much anymore in people or in situations. Sometimes the whole world sort of seems to have a glow, like a soft, fuzzy kind of feel. Or people, you know, that you once would have had in the category of an enemy suddenly become in the category of a friend <laughs> when you're practicing the Brahma Viharas. Also, if you look back in your past, you might, you know, look at a certain event that is a very difficult memory. And when you're in a state of metta, you look at it and it doesn't affect you. It just... Yeah, it doesn't have the same impact because the mind is so kind of soft and 
happy within itself, contained within itself. And this in itself isn't the wisdom, but the wisdom is in seeing that our perceptions are conditioned, our perceptions are fabricated. Depending on what the state of our mind, we experience things differently. So this is very interesting because it shows there is no inherent reality to what we experience, right? Things are conditioned. In that sense, we can say things are empty of inherent existence. And yet at the same time, if things are fabricated, we can choose, we can decide how we want to shape our experience and our perceptions, and we can choose the perceptions that benefit us and that benefit others. So I think this is really the power of the Buddha's teachings, you know, to help us understand that we do have some influence on how we see reality, how we create reality, but ultimately that reality is created. And until we stop creating, we are going to be tied up in this cycle of existence. So compassion is both the motivation, also the a quality that comes along the way, but it's also the result of deep insight. And I think the real reason for the Buddha's existence, the thing that caused him to continue, you know, to live and to teach and to serve. And the same thing for Bhikkhuni Sangamitta, you know. She'd already finished her job. She'd already realized arahatship, the highest stage of liberation. But it wasn't enough for her, you know. She wanted to spread the Dhamma, so she went to Sri Lanka, started the Bhikkhuni Sasana. And, you know, thousands of women ordained as Bhikkhunis and apparently also attained the final goal of liberation with her. And she used to practice in solitude as well as in community. So she had a little kuti called the sanctuary, which was where she spent quiet mornings or afternoons, and then she'd be in the community the rest of the day. And so she contributed to, you know, the sasana existing today. You know, for the strength of the Buddha's teachings, it requires the fourfold assembly, which is the laymen, women, bhikkhus, and bhikkhunis. So this is really the biggest gift of compassion that anyone can give us. And I think, you know, if we reflect on that with appreciation and, and gratitude, we imbibe though that gratitude in our hearts. It gives us the motivation to continue on our path and to know that no moment is ever wasted on the path. Okay. So we're already at about 3.15, but I was told that we're on Sri Lankan time. <laughs> I was told by an anonymous person who may or may not be Sri Lankan. <laughs> um, I don't know if we have time for any a quick question or, or we need to move on. Is there anything anyone would like to ask? Or? In case anything wasn't clear. Otherwise we can talk later if you like. Yeah? Okay, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's been a pleasure.